Genesis 11. Tower of Babel. Genesis 12 through 15. Abraham's promise. Genesis 16. Birth of Ishmael. Genesis 17. Circumcision. And we'll stop with this one right here. Genesis 9, 18 and 19. Sodom and Gomorrah. So Genesis 1 and 2. Creation. Genesis 3. The first sin. Genesis 4. Cain, Abel, and Seth. Genesis 5. Enoch and Methuselah. Genesis 6 through 10. Noah and the flood. Genesis 11. Tower of Babel. Genesis 12 through 15. Abraham's promise. Genesis 16. The birth of Ishmael. Genesis 17. Circumcision. Everybody says everything else so loud. Genesis 9, 18 and 19. Genesis 18 and 19. Genesis 17. Circumcision. Genesis 16. Birth of Ishmael. Come on, Zeb. Genesis 12 through 15. Abraham's promise. Genesis 11. Tower of Babel. Genesis 6 through 10. Noah and the flood. Genesis 5. Enoch and Methuselah. Genesis 4. Cain, Abel, and Seth. Genesis 3. The first sin. Genesis 1 and 2. Creation. How many books are in the New Testament? How many books in the Old Testament? How many books in the whole Bible? How many men wrote the Bible? About how many years did it take? Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Job, Psalms and Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations. Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Job, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk. Just held it lower. Um, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Acts and letter to the Romans. First and second Corinthians. Galatians and Ephesians. Philippians, Colossians. First and second Thessalonians, first and second Timothy, Titus, Amen. Hebrews, James, first and second Peter, first and second and third John, Jude and Revelation, Genesis one and two, creation, Genesis three, the first and Genesis four, and Abel and Seth, Genesis five. Enoch and Methuselah. Boy, you ain't going to miss that one, are you? Genesis 6 through 10. Noah and the Flood. Genesis 11. Tower of Bible. Genesis 12 through 15. Abraham's Promise. Genesis 16. Birth of Ishmael. Genesis 17. Circumcision. Genesis 18 and 19. Sodom and Gomorrah. What's the definition of true success? What's the definition of true failure? What's God's ideal for marriage? And when we grow up, we're going to marry a faithful Christian. Walk back to mom and dad. You guys are participating.
We'll make this a lot quicker than this morning. Here's the bulletin. Oh, I'm kidding. We are going to uh, highlight a few things from the bulletin. Uh, of course, we have a few visitors here this evening, folks. We really love you being here. It's a, a great honor to be able to uh, worship with you this evening, and we pray that uh, your journeys will be safe and sound uh, no matter where you're coming from or where you're going. Appreciate you. Um, want to mention a, a few baptisms this uh, last week, uh, last Sunday night, as a matter of fact. Uh, we had a new sister in Christ come forward and was baptized, and uh, we know that she needs all the encouragement that she can get. Uh, she a uh, young, young lady and, and uh, has just come out of the world, so try to step forward. Uh, I know that there was a few baptisms last week and six today. I don't know how we'll ever get to know them, but I, we will pray for them, that's for sure. Uh, speaking about that, I'm going to go ahead and read this if I can. Uh, seeing Randy just hand me this on the way up here. And it is from one of the uh, inmates. And I guess he's been a been kind of a problem child uh, for them. And Randy says, you never know what will touch somebody. And uh, he said, he said I, it's just his prayer request. He said, Heavenly Father, I come to you asking for humility. Help me to get over myself so that I can learn learn to like or so I can lead like Jesus led. Help me to to this is gonna be difficult. Help me to learn how to put others first. Always help me to be a servant and always recognize the needs of others. Create in me a heart that cares for those in need. Take away from me, Lord, any feed, any feelings of superiority. Rid me of any feelings that prevent me from uh, caring for others or fulfilling tasks others may find uh, low. I want to grant by your standard. I want to be great by your standards, which I know means putting others first and living them just as Jesus did. I'm sure that there was a lot of a lot of studies in between what they first was introduced to and and the individual that wrote that prayer. I'd like to uh, uh, mention that communi- uh, communion uh, preparers are still needed if you're able. Um, there's a sign-up sheet on the board. Um, and then uh, one other house keeping business here is... Uh, out on the foyer, the, the elders have approved this. He said uh, it, it's basically a, a support for the Marshfield schools. And anyway, he says stop by Wendy Marshfield on the on the ninth. It'd be next Friday, I believe. And uh, thirty percent of the qualifying sales as a result of your participation will go to Marshfield School System, uh, School Foundation. And uh, I was told that either you need to pick one of these up and hand to them, or you need to take a picture of one of these and show them the picture. So 30% of the things that you purchase that qualify will be given to them. The last things on my list tonight is, is uh, well, all the sick uh, just really want to 
uh, focus on a few of our own members here and and uh, I know that they're all important, don't get me wrong, that Connie Cruz will be having uh, surgery on the 20th uh, following her uh, chemo treatments and we need to keep that family in our prayers and, and uh, I'm sure some cheer would go a long ways in that family. Uh, Pat Cruz will be having surgery on, on the 8th, and that's this coming Thursday, so uh, just remember her come the 8th, that uh, she'll need our, our prayers as well. Uh, Deanna, uh, Dina Kennegator, when did she break her foot? A week ago Saturday. Okay, I, I did not recognize that or remember that. Anyway, so she's recovering at home, and Roy Phillips is at home. He's comfortable, and uh, and so he'll be uh, going in for uh, follow-up doctor appointments uh, tomorrow, and I think Thursday is what I understood. If there's nothing else, we'll turn this over to our song leader, following our prayer. Let's go in to worship and to our Lord's uh, our prayer. Father, we come before you now thanking you so much for your love. Thank you for giving us the gift of the knowledge of, of the scriptures, of the knowledge of Jesus Christ. And Father, we give you honor, all honor and glory for saving us from ourselves. We are truly grateful for that. And, then, and in that, Father, we, we return thanks at this hour. We pray to worship you in truth and in kind. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Number 535 will be our first song. I want to echo what Haley said to all your visitors. We're glad to have you. You sojourners, we're glad to have you back. I thought I picked up a little bit of accent change on you guys. You were down there. Can you believe it's February? It's crazy. 535.
before the uh, opening prayer will be 221. 221. We'll sing it through twice. <clears throat> to sing praises to you and, and study a portion of your word. Father, we thank you so much for your son. He came to this world to save us from our sins, and we love him so much. Father, we love you. We're grateful to, to see that Rick and Kathy and Terry and Ruth is back with us. And please bless all those that, that are requesting prayers and and be with us as we continue for our service. May we worship you in spirit and in truth. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. <clears throat> Number 205. I'm sorry, <clears throat> 509 is what it is. 509 if you're using the books. will be the song before the lesson. We'll sing a wonder.
We're glad you're here this evening. It's good to be together as brethren once more tonight. And I know it's not been sunshiny, but that's coming, right? At least the sun can shine in here in your life. So we appreciate that so much. Tonight we have Kevin and Vicki Young from the Willard Congregation with us. And uh, not to embarrass them or put them in front of anybody, but they are here. And they've been going through a grandparent experience with grandbabies and uh, being, being born premature. But all is well, I understand, which is good news. We like hearing that. It's also good news to know that some of you that have been ill are, are doing well and things are going well in your life. We uh, rejoice at that. Tonight, just in case you can't notice from the screen, we have the subject related to eyes. And as you know, eyes are important. Most of us were given two. It's like our ears, though. That means it's important, right? It's amazing what the eyes can do. And I'm not going to go into the aspect of the uh, amazing creation that God has given us with the eyes. But I I'm, am going to focus on what we have mentioned in 1 Kings chapter 1, verses 17 through 24. And if you have your Bibles, uh, please take them out so you can follow along. We'll have some passages on the screen. But it's important also to look at what we're told. And as we do that, as you look at 1 Kings chapter 1, it starts out with the uh, phrase, now... King David was old. Well, how many of you feel that problem in your life? It seems like the days as they move onward, we get older and older and we start to feel it more and more. Well, David was old, advanced in years. And it was to the point, if y'all remember Harry before he passed away, he was cold all the time and he was living in the wrong house when he stayed with us. And David was cold. He advanced the years to that point. It was hard for his body to keep up and keep its warmth. And so they put covers on him, but he could not get warm. And that was our brother Harry. He could not get warm. And thankfully, some of y'all are nice. I believe Ron bought him a, a comforter, an electric comforter that he was afraid to use. But he had it if he really, really needed it. David was that way. And there were a lot of things going on in David's life. No matter what age you are, even if you're getting older and older, things don't always get better and better. And there was a problem because Adonijah, the son of Haggith, exalted him saying, I will be king. Unfortunately, he did not have a right to lay that claim. He was not chosen by God, but he was going to try to take that upon himself. And verse 6 says, And his father had not rebuked him at any time by saying, Why have you done so? You know, there's a problem in the world with fathers that don't do their job. And sometimes, as we know, when we don't do our job as fathers, things come back to challenge us and make our life difficult in old age. But also, it's interesting, as you look at this passage of Scripture, it speaks of a description of Adonijah. It says, he was also very good-looking. His mother had borne him after Absalom. Well, being good-looking doesn't give you... The power to take upon you rights that God does not give. Verse 11. So Nathan is involved in this passage, in this chapter. And he spoke to Bathsheba, the mother of Solomon, saying, Have you not heard that Adonijah, the son of Haggath, has become king, and David our Lord does not know it? It's time to act, in other words. And Nathan's going to put things in motion with Bathsheba. And so in verse 12, we read, Come, please, let me now give you advice that you may save your own life and the life of your son Solomon. So we have a very serious condition going on in 1 Kings chapter 1. And Solomon, as we know, will become king. But unfortunately, right now for David, there is a dilemma and a predicament, as we might say, or a tough spot that he has to deal with. And then we go to verse 13. That Sheba is told to go immediately to King David and say to him, Did you not, my lord, O king, swear to your maidservant, saying, Surely your son Solomon shall reign after me, and he shall sit on my throne? Why then has Adonijah become king? What a powerful question. In other words, what's going on here? And this is something that must be reckoned with. And then she said to him, My Lord, you swore by the Lord your God to your maidservant, saying, Surely Solomon your son shall reign after me, and he shall sit on my throne. So now look 
Adonijah has become king. And now, my lord the king, you do not know about it. David was still king. He should have been in the know, right? But that doesn't appear to be the, the case. That speaks volumes to us who are growing older. It tells us that even though we grow older, we still have to pay attention to things as much as possible. And I know it's sometimes difficult, and sometimes it, it becomes quite a challenge to deal with things that, that we just really don't want to deal with, but age doesn't give us always an excuse. David was without excuse. He had a responsibility, and it was there in reference to who was going to be king. And he's told in verse 19 that he has sacrificed oxen and fatted cattle and sheep in abundance, talking about Adonijah, and has invited all the sons of the king, Abathar the priest, Joab the commander of the army, but Solomon your servant, he has not invited. So there's things going on that need to be dealt with. And so look at verse 20. And as for you, my lord, O king, the eyes of all Israel are on you that you should tell them who will sit on the throne of my lord the king after him. Otherwise it will happen when my lord the king rests with his fathers that I and my son Solomon will be counted as offenders. And this is not the plan of God. This is not what God wanted. And therefore, David had a responsibility. And as you look at verse 20, pay attention again to the, to the letters I've highlighted in the words, O king, the eyes of all Israel are on you. And folks, that's a bunch of eyes. In other words, the people are watching. I'm real accustomed to y'all looking at me, by the way. Been here, uh, it started, I guess we're in our sixth year with preaching for the congregation. And I'm accustomed to your eyes. In fact, so much so that if you're not in your place, I begin to wonder where you're at. We went to Panama, had a new bunch of eyes. And I, I don't know how comfortable you are public speaking, but when you're before an audience and you got all those eyes, and everybody's got two, so it doubles the amount of people that are gathered. When they're looking at you, you, you realize it. Somebody asked me, do you get nervous when you preach? Yeah, every time. Even with eyes I recognize. But when we were over in Panama, here's all these new eyes looking at me. And, and I was very self-conscious of that because I knew those eyes were upon me. Here was what they had classified as a Locito Gringo, or Gringo Loquito. There we go. Is that right? Where's um, Nacho at? Is that right? Well, that's what they called me. To, to interpret that, they called me the Loco Gringo. And those eyes were upon me. Wherever we went, wherever we taught and we preached, there, there were those new eyes looking at me, eyes upon me. And I, I, I recognize that. It did, it did bother me a little bit because I'm looking at people I'm not accustomed to seeing for the first time. And, of course, they're looking at me, wondering who this fellow is. Some of them understood English, and that helped a little bit. But what was especially interesting over in Panama was working with the young ministers, the ages from 12 to 22. Because those, those young people were intense. Here was a preacher from America. And many of them didn't understand the English. Some did. But they understood the interpreter. And so those eyes were fixed. And you could have heard a pin drop when I was preaching. They were there intent upon hearing what was being said. And they were staring at me. And one day we got out for the group picture and they're all lined up and we're staring at them, getting ready to take a picture, but they started staring back. And when we got them all lined up and got in front of them to get this picture, they are all eyes on me and my wife, Kathy. And it didn't bother me too, mad, too much because I don't have eyes in the back of my head, but Kathy does, and so... You know, I haven't been a school teacher. But no, it was, it was an exciting day to have all those young people there. But again, I was still sub, uh, conscious of what they were doing. They were watching. And because people are watching, and because 
eyes of the world are upon us. The outsiders, not only the eyes within the body of Christ, but even the outsiders. Because of the outsiders, we've got to be conscious that eyes are looking at, at us as Christians. And therefore, it's important that we recognize that we have to live in such a way to let Christ be seen in us. Y'all remember the song, Let the Beauty of Jesus Be Seen in Me. That's our challenge. The world needs to see Jesus in us. And where the rubber meets the road is many times on Monday when we start off to work. We start our weeks out in the world where people have the privilege of having their eyes upon us. And it's amazing at how many eyes are watching. But in order for us to be fit, to be seen of men. In order for Christ to be seen in us, we have the challenge of looking unto Jesus. Because if we're going to exhibit Jesus in our lives, we're going to have to have our eyes on Jesus. This depiction in this graphic is pretty good because we're looking at Jesus with the crown of thorns. This is a display of the sacrificial Jesus. Because in order for Jesus to live and to be seen in us, we are going to lead sacrificial lives, sacrificing ourselves for others. Doing what Jesus would do in our lives if it was Jesus in front of people. And folks need to see that we're different in this world. Because what did Jesus do? Who for the joy that was set before Him endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Isn't it amazing when we witness a Christian out in the world living the Christian life like Jesus? You see... Those willing to go the second mile. Those who don't speak like others. Those who do not talk and walk like others. In the world, they live like Jesus because they want Jesus to be seen in them. The Apostle Paul in Galatians 2 verse 20 wrote the words, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. There's our challenge. And that's a verse I know most of you could probably quote. But it's a verse that cries out. To allow Christ to be seen in me. And Paul goes on. He says in the life which I now live in the flesh. I live by faith in the Son of God. Who loved me and gave himself for me. Christ died for me so that he could live in me. And I could live following him. And I can show the world that Christ is living in me by the way I behave. That's why we look at 1 Peter 2, verse 21, another familiar verse. That Christ suffered for us, leaving us an example that we should follow His steps. And notice verse 22, who committed no sin. Wouldn't you like to be able to say that as a Christian? I don't commit sin. But John says to me that if I say that, I'm I'm not telling the truth. Because we do sin. We just don't live in sin. But we sin knowing that we have the forgiveness if we turn from our sins and live as God wants us to live and to seek His favor through repentance. But Jesus, as one who committed no sins, was worthy to suffer and to go to the cross. And because of that, I can see Jesus as my example. And as you look at the graphic, What do we have Jesus giving us an example in? In service, in living the Christian life, the life that is pleasing to God, in suffering, and even in forgiving. Remember, the disciples themselves had problems with forgiving. And also, Jesus set the example in loving. And what an example He set in all of those areas. And those are things that I can follow by following His example. As we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1, Paul said, imitate me just also as I imitate Christ. 
Christ set the example. And we follow Christ by following his example. And then, of course, what happens? Folks, follow our example. Elders are to be examples. Fathers are to be examples. Mothers are to be examples. And Christians are examples. And we walk according to the pathway that's given us by the Almighty God through the, His Word. And that pathway is that pathway to heaven that will not only provide the access for us, but also those who will follow our example. And therefore, as we look at the responsibility we have in 1 Thessalonians chapter, chapter 5, verse 22, in relationship to how we live, the Apostle Paul says to the church, the brethren of Thessalonica, abstain from all appearance of evil. Now, the New King James says every form of evil. And that is in reference to if you look at evil and there's some kind of form of it, you stay away from it. In other words, it doesn't take a lot to figure out what you and I need to be staying away from. And that is that which is in form or in appearance of evil. Now, most of you recognize the graphic. I was surprised that in Panama, we saw several casinos. And just like here in America, there were people going into those casinos to do whatever they do in the casinos. But then I think about what's the kind of appearance that we need to to present to the world. We don't want to be among the crowd going into the casinos. We want to be those who are men and women in Christ that take our stand for what is right. Because we are to abstain from every form, every appearance of that which is evil. One of the problems that we ran into in Panama besides there being casinos, not that that was a temptation for Terry and Ruth at all, nor me or Kathy, or any of the brethren we were with. But one of the problems we had is a similar problem we're experiencing here in Marshfield now, that didn't used to be, and, and in Springfield, it's been going on for a long time. But when you go to a restaurant, there in the restaurant is a bar. Now, I, how many of you remember that you could go to a restaurant and there not be a bar? But look at it now. How do we balance? And there's the challenge with the words abstain from all appearance of evil, abstain from every form of evil when we're faced with situations like this. One man in the commentary, and I forget which one it was, I just captured the words, but I wanted to share them with you. Not only do we flee from that which is evil, we flee from that which appears to be evil. And that's tough. Go into a restaurant and here's a big bar right in front of you. And this was a problem, like I said, in Panama as well. And we were having dinner one day in the old town of Panama City. And we had with us, the brother was working as interpreter for us, uh, his name is Raphael, and then uh, a young man that was beginning a new work with the congregation where I preached at, uh, his name was Marcus, and they were both with us, and then Terry, Ruth, and myself, and Kathy, and we went to this restaurant, and they had uh, American food, and it looked good, looked reasonably priced, and of course, there in this restaurant, like most of them in Panama, here's a bar. Well, we sat away from it, ordered our food, but Raphael and Marcus both ordered fruit drinks. They're accustomed to having fruit drinks. I ordered a can of Coke, and it came in the can, and, and I don't remember what y'all ordered, but it was probably a soft drink like that. And they brought to Raphael and Marcus their fruit drinks in glasses, they were just like the ones the people were drinking alcohol in, sitting at the bar and other places throughout the restaurant. We were at another restaurant in a mall, a Mexican food restaurant there in Panama City after worship on a, the last Sunday that we were there. And 
Yes, the place had been recommended by Brother Jack Farber. Y'all had ate there before. Once again, there's a bar. And Raphael's wife, Gabby, ordered a fruit drink of some sort, and they bring it out, and it looks like a tequila cup that you see in, in Mexican restaurants. And, and, of course, in both situations, you know Rick doesn't keep his mouth shut. So I started teasing these brethren and Gabby about what they were drinking. And we won't mention nacho and beer at all. He can explain that to you. But you see, that presents a problem because their drinks looked like alcoholic drinks. Sometimes it gets tough, right? So we have to make sometimes some very challenging decisions and hard decisions. And, and we are challenged by the verse to abstain from that form of that appearance of evil. To the point that in 1 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 9, when Paul, in writing about the meats being sacrificed to idols and eating, eating meats, says, But beware lest somehow this liberty of yours, referencing the knowledge of knowing that things sacrificed to idols mean nothing, in this particular context, he says, This liberty of yours becomes a stumbling block to those who are weak. So we're challenged as Christians to with reference to the fact that people are looking at us to make sure that we don't do those things which appear to be doing something wrong, something evil. Because we know that there are a lot of folks that just can't wait to point a finger and say, you hypocrite. We don't want to give them that opportunity any more than we have to, do we? So we are challenged. And it's sometimes a difficult challenge that we have to face up to. But something that I want to challenge you as we get into this new year to think about. As you live your life, how can I be better this year? Well, add this to your list. I'm going to abstain from every appearance of evil. I'm going to disassociate myself with anything that people can point a finger and go, you hypocrite. Or anything that might be a stumbling block to our weaker brethren. In closing this lesson, Bathsheba told David that all Israel was looking at him. She's telling him that they're watching to see what you do. In Luke chapter 4, verse 16, we have an interesting context in reference to Jesus. He comes to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue, and on the Sabbath day, what does he do? He stands up to read, and stood up to read. And he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah, and he, when he had opened the book, Scripture tells us he found the place where it was written. I find that interesting. You know, we're told to search the Scriptures. I don't know how difficult it was for Jesus to find that place. I do recognize that probably the parchment he had was in Hebrew. It reads left to right. And it could have been um, a Greek Septuagint. We're not told. Or a Greek copy of the Isaiah, but very likely it was Hebrew, being in the synagogue. And it probably was not marked out in chapter and verses like we have it, but it didn't matter. That's all we don't know. But what we do know is that he found the place where it was written. And then we read, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And so Jesus reads some very powerful words that were actually, as we know, pointing to himself. And then the scripture says, he closed the book and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And then what do we read? And the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on him. Let me ask this. Are your eyes fixed on Jesus? What a day this must have been for Jesus to 
have all those eyes fixed on him. When we think about living in this world, we need our eyes fixed on Jesus because there's a whole lot of folks out there who have their eyes fixed on us. And they need to see Jesus living in us. And so therefore I challenge you as we go into this new year to think about living in such a way that you're conscious of those eyes that are fixed on you. And I give God the thanks for so many of you at this congregation who live those kind of lives that are worthy of having those eyes fixed on you. Thank God for you. And may we all be conscious every day of our lives of those eyes. If you're here this morning or tonight, let me say, I hope you're here this morning, but if you're here tonight and you need to respond to the invitation, I want you to think about as we sing the song that there are eyes fixed on you, but also think about that set of eyes that we have described in heaven, the all-seeing eye of God watching you. He knows what's in your heart, your life. We don't necessarily, but God does. And if you know that God is looking down to you and, and He recognizes you need to do something about your life tonight, then why wait? Don't put it off. You may not have the time. Whether you need, you need to be baptized into Christ or be restored like others, or you need prayer like Andrew, you need to confess a need for others' help and for God's forgiveness. The invitation is open for you. If you can see, then why not see your need? As we stand and sing, would you come?
not get a chance to take communion this morning. Uh, could I see the hands of those that would like to participate? Would you bow with me, please? Our most gracious, kind, and loving Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for this day you blessed us with. And now for this opportunity to partake of this emblems that represents the price your son paid on that cross for the forgiveness of our sins. And as we partake of this bread, remembering his body and how it was broken on that cross for the forgiveness of our sins, let us do so in a well-pleasing and worthy manner. And it's in your precious son's name we pray. Amen. Would you bow with me again? Once again, our Heavenly Father, we take this fruit of the vine that represents the blood that your Son so willingly shed. And remembering the suffering he went through on that cross so that we can have the hope of eternity. Bless us now as we partake of this fruit of the vine. And it's in your precious Son's name we pray. Amen. Is there anyone here that needs a collection plate? I now want to thank each and every one of you for the love you show us every day. We missed you so much on our trip. I can't begin to tell you. Every Sunday, even though it was a blessing, was not the same without this family. Thank you for all you do. And if I didn't get around to talking to you this morning, I apologize. But I want to personally thank each and every one of you for helping us do the work that we did in Panama. Our closing song will be number 414. We'll sing the first, second, and fourth verses. I told you Rick starts...
Will you pray with me, please? Our most gracious and loving Father, we thank you for this one more opportunity that you gave us to gather together and worship to thee. Father, we thank you for bringing back Rick and Kathy, Terry and Ruthie from Panama to us. Father, we thank you for Rick's ability to preach your word, for the might well he a good job. Also, Father, we pray that you with the elder Rick and Paul and the decisions of the job they do, be leaders in this congregation. The any decision they take do according to your will. Be with uh, Phillips and Kathy as well as they work in among us. Father, we pray that you be with the deacons and wives of them that still working among ourselves too. Father, we thank you for the visitors that you bring in our way. Now we pray that you be with them, give a safe return to their own place of destination. Father, we pray that you be with the armed forces, wherever they might be, watch over them, protect them, and bring them back safe home. We the first responders also in this country, with the police in the cities and towns that watch over everybody else. We pray that you be with us this week and keep us safe, Father, and bring us back next upon time. This I pray through your precious Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, sir. Where is Bobby?